Thank you, everyone. I have the most fun job here. I've listened to a lot of other lectures. I just get to be a contractor today. This is great. It's all pretty pictures, not a lot of science. But what we're going to go through is what we've done at INDOT. Now, I don't work for INDOT. I, do, I build bridges for INDOT. But I noticed that this product was coming out and going along. Um, and they were in trial basis. I liked what was happening. So I continued down that road um, independently, uh, kind of took it on myself to do so. Like I've said, I've got 25 years in the industry. I know I don't look that old. Thank you. Uh, mainly, I'm a, I'm a third generation bridge builder, um, a second generation concrete pumper, and a first generation engineer. Um, and it's my passion, it's what I do. Please come up and talk to me anytime you see me because my wife will not talk to me about this stuff. <laughs> and I really enjoy it. So anything you want to go through, um, I, I enjoy. So the, I'm going to read from the slide for this one because this is officially what I'm supposed to be doing um, to cover an overview of the case studies, uh, means and methods for the use of nanosilicas in concrete and the transportation system, problems encountered, previous conventional concrete solutions provided by the incorporation of nanosilicas for the Indiana DOT. So I'm sure we've all seen something like this. That, and I, I said the bad and the ugly because it goes to the problems of the old. This, this particular, you can even see the bad corner over there. Um, and I am not hating anything for SCMs um, or any alternatives used. I just noticed the problems that we had systemically throughout. And I blame it a lot on the culture that was created um, in what we had. So that's just an example of what we had. And you can see these almost all the way across the country in, in high silica content mixes that were used in addition to. And it goes from bad practices um, to poor usage and poor uh, mix design. Uh, so these are the problems that we were dealing with, especially in, in bridges and in overlays, that started around 2016, 2018, because beforehand, dot, 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 is paved with good intentions. So what we normally did prior to this um, in 2016 and, and before was, at the end of every project, for every one of our bridge contracts, we had this nice item that was lump sum um, for limits of surface seal. Now, as we, as everybody knows, you know, good practices say that if we pour our concrete, we should probably surface seal it afterwards, after 28 days, and then we should probably get on a regiment, a regiment of maintenance schedule to continue uh, the application of that surface seal if we want to get the full design life out of the concrete. And the in-dot maintenance crews were just having a heck of a time trying to keep up. So they said, what can we do um, to provide so-called, quote-unquote, internal sealing? This is where it came with the, with the good intentions. So the mix prior to, you can see, is um, let's just stick with class C, which is our deck concrete. So it's a 658 with a 0.44 water cement ratio. Typical concrete, and we surface seal afterwards, walk away. Then comes, we no longer have to surface seal, so we don't have to close traffic, wait 28 days from traffic, open it up. We can use this internal sealing um, as the solution, and it has to be incorporated into the concrete. And those two options that were given by the Indiana Department of Transportation were you can either add 3% uh, silica fume, this is for bridge concrete, not overlays, and then or, or you could do a 30% slag replacement. And we had longer service life, reduced maintenance, these were the good things, less reliability on maintaining that schedule or the regiment that continues year and year and year now. Um, so here's what happened after that implementation. Is you did have increased costs um, with both the slag, more so in the silica fume. Um, the temperature restrictions with the slag, we're, we're not allowed to place it between October and April for the most part. Um, the slower set times with slag were somewhat troubling when you were on a job with a schedule that had to be um, done at a certain time. You just had to wait longer. Now as an engineer, I'm not afraid of waiting longer. But as a contractor, 
when you're put under those uh, conditions where you have to move the job, um, you know, I would I would choose the silica fume a lot out of those, even if it was uh, less cost effective because I knew I could get my break sooner. But the benefit, there's no ceiling required. And I've got less consistency up in there because you all know that once you deal with inconsistencies, either coming from a slag source um, or different slag sources, that you're, you're chasing air around. It's the same thing with, you know, your fly ash. So that's what was added per what we would call our, our same old, same old sample. Same picture again, but you can see, I don't, I don't know if you guys get as close to concrete as I do. Um, but I had, to t I had to take that picture to send somebody to prove to them there was a crack there. I guess when I'm on my hands and knees with a, mi with a magnifying glass, I guess I've, I've overplayed my hand in, in cracking. But the volatility was, was evident, and it's still evident um, through that process. Because we had the, the pop-outs, we had the non-homogeneous mixing that caused that, along with what are we getting in the deck and what kind of, you can see that's, that's all plastic shrinking that was going on there. Um, and it comes down to the problem of curing the concrete and who's at fault, which I think there was a presentation earlier, which was great, like, who, who's at fault? Uh, you know, that would have been fun. So this is another one um, that my guys, stupid burlap, right? You, you're out on a deck pour, and they're tired. You've worked all day. As it's going, you've got another crew back there, and now they've got to deal with this burlap for wet cure. Um, and it was one of the things that started to come about with using um, a nanosilica to be able to use as a cure method, as an internal cure. Um, so we have the additional time and resources with that, but then we also have, um, when you're in the process of a wet cure, I know Pennsylvania DOT has a 14-day standard wet cure. We had a seven-day standard wet cure, but getting the contractor and NDOT to agree on policing that method of wet cure. Um, and you're wet curing only the top surface. And as we have here, this was our very first pour um, where we used the nanosilica as an internal cure mechanism. Um, I couldn't convince Mike Nelson, uh, who's a, the lead concrete engineer for the Indiana Department of Transportation, to leave off the cure compound. Um, because I wanted to do it with nothing. I mean, if it's going to work, it's going to work. Uh, but this was, this was our first go round. And the things that we changed from that first pour on, uh, the curing worked. Yes. The culture was amazing. I've placed personally, oh, 30, 40 pours, um, with the nanosilica. And I haven't seen my guys add a single drop of water. To bless the concrete. That's pretty impressive. So that type, that type of culture is a good thing. And then our last question was, is it good for the concrete in the long run? And that's where I had to weigh, is what I'm seeing, what you guys will hear for the rest of the, this presentation when it comes down to um, what nanosilicas do for the concrete on that scale, for particle packing, as you mentioned, John. So as it goes through, is it good for the concrete in the long run? Because as a contractor, I'm just excited that I don't have to cover a deck anymore. Um, so th that is what happened. The better attitude, the increased, the increased efficiency and pumpability, which we, ru we run uh, a fleet of concrete pumps as well. And that was interesting because on that job, just the day before, I had a standard Class C mix um, uh, for another contractor that we pumped concrete for. And I could record the bar pressures from the pump kit. Um, and when you see a difference in a in the same mix of close to 70 or 80 bar pressure differential, you know um, that you've got something going on in there. And as as we all learned, uh, forward finding out, there are several benefits to an nanosilica. One of them being a viscosity modifier. Um, and that was uh, and I've talked to the people at E5, which is the product that we used. And you know they don't they don't claim it's it's a viscosity modifier, but I can certainly tell you that um, I experience pump uh, pressure reduction when using it. Uh, as far as where we went next, take a memo. 
One of the coolest ways, if there's any DOT transportation officials in here, one of the coolest ways I can say to do this is instead of writing it into your specification, allow yourself a living document like a construction memorandum. And that's what was done. You could write an initial, an initial construction memorandum to do this work and very specifically call out what you need, but then have the ability at a moment's notice to either cancel it, change it, amend it, or write a, a revision to it in addition to thereof. One of the most important things I'm saying if you're going to implement new technology is probably this right here. So in that first memo, we eliminated wet cure. Um, we were able to open earlier based on strength, not so much based on the wet cure because it's not the same thing. If I've still got wet cure on a job, I can't live load it with construction live load or I can't even switch traffic if I've got other things to do. But if I have that break and I consider that the internal cure is still curing, then I'm allowed to load that with what I need to do for the, for the advancement of the schedule and the construction process. Um, and then the other thing we did was eliminate the use, totally abandon the use of evaporation retarders because that was the culture. That was a culture issue. Guys in the field were using evaporation retarders as a finishing aid. Um, and a lot of you in here probably went, ew, and you should, because it's ew. You know what happens to the surface when things like that are rubbed into or finished into the surface with an evaporation retarder. Then we asked, that was simply adding four ounces per hundred weight of the internal cure. Um, we asked, can we do more? Because I specifically wanted to conquer the problems in the pictures that we saw with overlay. Overlays are just one of those things I've talked about it before, it's like tickling the dragon's tail. They're very volatile mixes. They're high in cementitious content, um, and there's a lot of exposed area for not a lot of volume, very susceptible to shrinkage, very susceptible to the problems you have while placing. Um, and you can see the standard class C over on the left, which is what we started with, and then there's different types of in-dot concrete, um, and the, I, there's the class C with micro and the class C with uh, 30 percent slag. So what we did is we increased the water cement ratio. Very important. We increased the water cement ratio from a 0.42 to a 0.47 with a 580 pound per cubic yard mix as opposed to the 658 or the 658 with a 50 pound increase for the overlays. So we've got a lot more powder content in there at a 0.42 but look at the water difference. So we've got a, a higher workability mix and a friendlier mix, even for pumping, but at the 0.47, and we've only got 272 pounds of water in there as opposed to 200, almost 300 pounds of water. So that right there helps with shrinkage alone, and that's what we saw. So this is, this is the old overlays um, with way too much silica fume, very bad. This, this picture right here, even especially, this is after there was too much cracking, and we milled off the overlay to see what was going on. So all of those are undistributed um, silica balls in there. Um, <laughs> and you can see the type of cracking we got on all these overlays. And we said there's got to be a better way because we're all fighting. Contractors are fighting with NDOT, and NDOT's fighting with uh, material suppliers about this mix is horrible. This is So we decided to be an idiot. That's me. Um, I did some overlays for private municipalities in the past, so I had an inkling that this was going to work, but I didn't need to be as stupid as I was this day. We had the opportunity to do this overlay because I was taking advantage of another contract that was under um, traffic restrictions. So instead of a nice cold joint down the middle, which I hate anyway for this, for this overlay, I had the chance to close down the entire road and do it all at once. Bad news is, it was, it was a really dry, windy day, and um, the evaporation rate, which you can see there, I took a screenshot that morning when I said I'm an idiot, um, it was uh, 0 0.302. Now INDOT says that if I get to a 0 0.05, if I get to a 0 0.05, I should be fogging that deck. I did not fog that deck. If I get to a point zero eight, I should shut down the pour. It was at this point that Mike Nelson walked up to me during that pour and said, you know, if this works, you might, you might have something on me here. 
And I said, Mike, it was never my intention to be an idiot, but if, today, if it works today, we're going to be good. And as a matter of fact, uh, we were good. That poor, three years later, it's still a magnificent looking structure. Um, and let's go to the current memo. Um, so you have two, mo two options. Like I said, the memo is great because you can reissue that memo with revisions with new ideas. The second memo included a two-mix option. So the first one was the original memo, which says you can take the old mix, which is the 3% uh, silica fume or the 30% slag, and add four ounces of internal cure. Um, or mix option two is you can reduce the cementitious content from, five, or from the, the 658 to 550 up to 600. It gives, the, it gives the supplier a little bit of play, which is nice. And then you can incorporate the four ounces of internal cure and eight ounces of the liquid fly ash, which is that um, pozzolanic component of it for the SCM. And keep in mind, this is what's amazing. This is voluntary at a zero, zero cost change order for contractors to do. INDOT is not requiring this whatsoever. This is an option for the contractor to do, and they're doing it um, to the tune of over 200 structures in Indiana. So we, the original use was just for bridge decks and bridge deck overlays. Just in the last year, I've, I've put it in substructure concrete everywhere because the benefits of the nanosilica, um, as far as the particle packing and what it does uh, to avoid problems with chloride. I don't know if you guys have ever been on a farm before, but I build bridges over streams adjacent to farms, and there's some caustic, caustic substances in those streams. We're very concerned with the deck, but nobody ever asked what's going on with the substructure. Um, so I put it in everything. I put it in the substructure, uh, concrete. Uh, you can see we placed it in the concrete wall before, uh, but specifically here it's been in slip form walls uh, with reduced concrete. So uh, that's pretty cool. In full depth we've used, um, full depth is actually a couple thousand yards in full depth uh, pavement, but the cost is the problem with the pavement when you're dealing with 40,000, 60,000 yards. The internal cure mechanism uh, could blow your bid budget, but the um, liquid fly ash budget for it uh, component, you can reduce your cement content without worrying about the irregularities that you sometimes get with a 20% fly ash replacement. So that's more affordable. But what's really nice is the concrete incidentals the driveways, the curbs, and the sidewalk, because in local uh, funding jobs, that's the stuff. We're, we're really looking at bridges a lot. We, that gets real close inspection. But on those other jobs, you have other portions of the work that don't garner as much attention, but they're the ones that you have problems with 15, 20 years down the road. You're paying close attention to this bridge structure because it gets inspected every two years. But when you go through a city street, do a bridge, and you have incidental construction on either side, and you've got, you know, Walt, who's 97 years old, running his tobacco store, and he goes out and he heavily salts his, the entrance to his driveway that was placed by NDOT every winter, you notice that there's problems with that concrete due to all the chloride interaction that he, Walt doesn't understand. He just sees his concrete peeling up. But this will deter most of that on the apertures. Okay. So this is where they're at now, and like I said, this is what's really cool, is this isn't required at all. This is totally voluntary by any number of contractors and material suppliers that want to participate in doing this. And so far, the full depth, you know, 202 pours for full depth bridge jacks, it's even more apparent in the overlays. Um, this, number, this number could be way updated from, uh, from now. Uh, from when we did it. This is courtesy of Mike Nelson. He keeps track of all this. Um, but I, like I said, it's very important, I think, to know that these, that, that this, these two products are the mixed designs that are optional are, have to be taken at a zero cost change order. Um, so there's really no incentive or beat down from the Department of Transportation to use this. They would prefer it, but they're not going to force it. So, the contractors take this on themselves to be able to place this material. Um, and I, I think that's a lot to say. So are there any easy questions 
Only. I'm only going to take easy ones.